All right. Hey there, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us uh, for tonight's webinar. My name is Andrew King. I'm the editor in chief of Canadian Musician Magazine and uh, yeah, hosting this webinar brought to you by NWC Webinars. In a moment, I'll introduce our uh, presenter, Adam Gallant from the Hill Sound Studio in Charlottetown. Uh, tonight, we're talking about basic mic techniques. So we're going to start with a bit of an overview of the different types of microphones typically used in recording, uh, talk about some of the different characteristics, their ideal uses, and uh, yeah, then we'll get into some basic uh, kind of industry standard staple microphone techniques for everything from vocals to acoustic and electric guitar, bass, drums, etc. Uh, and yeah, we invite your questions or comments throughout the whole thing. Uh, so you know, we're going to stop about halfway through the session for a short question period. We'll take anything that's, I guess, timely or relevant to anything that Adam or I have discussed. If we don't get to your question, then uh, fret not, because at the end of the session, we'll have a slightly longer uh, Q&A period. You can submit your questions um, via the little text window in your interface. And uh, yeah, as far as that interface, I'm just going to launch a quick poll here. Those of us that have joined us in the past know we're just trying to gauge um, who's joining us for the session, uh, both to, I guess, cater our discussion this evening, but also just to help inform the topics we choose for future sessions. So um, would love to hear how you're at all involved in the music or audio industry. I'll keep this open for a second. Uh, a few other housekeeping tips. In the handout section, you can download uh, what's a PDF of the slideshow that's going to comprise the uh, majority of the presentation this evening. Uh, there's some note-taking space on the right. So you do have time if you want to uh, print that off and jot some things down. I will say we typically keep our slideshows pretty bare and uh, rely very much on the conversation as the majority of the information for the webinar. This evening, though, there is, uh, we do have more slides than usual. There's a bit more information packed into them. So, um, yeah, please do download that PDF. Even if you're not going to take notes, just being able to reference it later will likely be very helpful. And I'll wrap up the poll in a second here. We've got about three quarters of attendees that have responded. A um, few other housekeeping things. Yeah, at the end of the session, uh, once we've logged off here, you'll be asked to fill out a very, very short survey, basically just assessing what you thought of the content, of the uh, overall presentation of the technical interface for tonight's session. And again, that just helps us uh, steer what we do in the future. Any comments on topics you'd like to see us tackle down the road, of course, are more than welcome. Um, there's also going to be a link uh, to a site from our sister company, musicbooksplus.com, where you can check out some uh, book titles related to our topic tonight if you want to do some further reading. Uh, there's also some tips there for making the most of uh, your webinar next time and uh, a discount code to take advantage of for musicbooksplus.com. So I'll stick with that. Um, got majority of our attendees. So I'll close the poll here in 30 seconds if you haven't voted, please do. I guess it's not a vote, but here we go. And yeah, I'll share these results with you. Um, so yeah, about a third of our participants are performing, recorders, performing or recording artists, which is great. People, uh, I guess, wanting just some basic tips to get some really clean, good tracks on their own. Uh, some songwriters joining us as well. Wow, that's probably the highest in the other category, so we'll assume it's some uh, budding studio professionals. Anyway, welcome to everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. Why don't we get started here? There we go. So yeah, you're joining us for Home Recording Basic Mic Techniques. Uh, my name is Andrew King, Editor-in-Chief of Canadian Musician Magazine, as well as our sister publications. Uh, but yeah, joining me this evening, Adam Gallant from the Hill Sound Studio in Charlottetown, PEI. He's worked with uh, a number of very popular artists from here in Atlantic Canada, as well as the CBC, the National Film Board. Um, just passing through a great PEI-based web series, uh, if you haven't heard of it and you're into, uh, I guess, kind of Grizzly comedy a la Trailer Park Boys, do check it out. Um, and yeah, he's got a great studio downtown Charlottetown. If you're not from PEI, but maybe looking for uh, somewhere to do some recording, a bit of a getaway, I can't think of a better place than the island. Uh, 
full disclosure, I live there myself, but thrilled to have Adam joining us this evening. I'll hand it over to him in a moment. Uh, just to tell you, this evening we're going to be taking you through a few things. We're going to talk about the different types of microphones used in recording and some of their ideal applications. Uh, Adam will have some ideas on, you know, if you're getting started with basic home recording, uh, a few mics that you might want, might want, to, might want to, want to, to do this kind of work proficiently. We'll share some basic techniques for everything from voice to electric and acoustic guitars, drums, and more, uh, and then some tips on how to assess whether what you're picking up is quality stuff. So yeah, why don't we get right into it here. Uh, Adam, we're thrilled to have you join us. We're going to go through each of the different polar or pickup patterns uh, available, like typically available on microphones. Just a quick walk through here. The name says a lot, but the main ones here are omnidirectional, uh, next is cardioid, supercardioid, or hypercardioid, which all kind of follow the basic uh, cardioid shape. And then there's the figure eight or bi-directional microphones. We're going to take you through what each of those means. Uh, yeah, Adam, pleasure having you here. And uh, why don't we get started here? The cardioid microphone, arguably the most ubiquitous in the industry. Of course, the Shure SM58 may be the most iconic example of that. Um, yeah, tell us a bit about the properties of these types of microphones and uh, their, I guess, most common studio uses, if you please. Uh, yeah, it's great yeah. to be here. Thanks for having me. It's great to share a bit of experience with people. Uh, in terms of this microphone one type, the cardioid, uh, it's all the cardioid because it's kind of like a heart. And um, the benefit being that at the back of the microphone, uh, there's not a lot of sound that will enter into the capsule. And therefore, if you're behind the microphone, it's quite quiet. And if you're behind the microphone, it's doing its job. It's picking up all of the sound that's uh, in the capsule. Um, this is, yeah, I'm sure a lot of you out there, if you're a singer-songwriter and you've played at a venue um, and you're singing into a little gray mic, it's probably going to be at the Shure SM58. And that's a prime example of the most classic cardioid microphone out there. Um, it's good because it prevents feedback. Uh, so you've got your monitor wedge on the stage, and that sound is coming out of the wedge and hitting the back of the microphone. And because of the nature of this uh, pickup pattern, you're not going to get as, as much feedback as you would say an Omni pickup pattern. Uh, um, and you'll see the most ubiquitous kind of ca uh, cardioid microphone in studios would be the Shure SM57. That's generally an instrument mic, but it has the, the same cardioid pickup pattern, and it's great for if you've got like a guitar amp in the same room as your drums, and you want to isolate as much as you can on that guitar amp. Bingo. And like, uh, you know, we mentioned here, it's good for close miking drums. Uh, is that like across the whole kit? Or, uh, yeah, if you were going to use some cardioid mics for your kit, where would it typically be placed? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, yeah, this is the SM7 on a snare, on toms, the cardioid pattern again is super useful for ejecting things like hi-hat from your snare or from all the cymbals to your toms like you really want to get when you're making up a drum kit generally um, for like a pop kind of big drum sound you're getting as kind of tight and isolated as possible from each independent instrument on the drum kit so nine times out of ten engineers are using uh, cardioid microphones for all of those close spot mics they'll call them and often uh, the overheads again cardioid because you want a focused kind of sound of the drum kit and less of the room sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess we'll have more specific examples of that when we talk about actually miting the kit. Um, but then, yeah, I mentioned there's supercardioid, there's hypercardioid. We don't have an image for hypercardioid, but as you can see here with the supercardioid, it's really just uh, sort of a further iteration of what we just saw with the cardioid makeup. So. Um, yeah, I guess here, what is the difference between the two, admitting that it's minor? Is there any instance where one would be much preferred over the other in studio? Uh, uh, yeah, definitely. Like, it's all about kind of focus. Like, I always talk about this as, as almost like a camera lens, and uh, a super cardioid, cardioid is going to have more reach. It's going to look deeper into the space almost and it's going to be narrower along the sides. Uh, and because of the nature of microphone technology, in order to create that kind of narrow focus, you end up having to open up the back of the microphone and letting a bit of sound in. Um, like what's mentioned here in this uh, slide is the boom mic. Um, and one of the benefits to this kind of picker pattern and, and, and a boom mic is that it gives you a sense of space 
So when you're, you know, using boom, a boom on set, uh, you kind of get the sound of the room as well as the dialogue. So it really sets the stage for the space that the characters are in. And dialogue editors really like this type of uh, sound, the sound of a boom mic versus kind of like the lapel mic or the hidden mics that you might find on set. Right. So like a shotgun microphone, if folks are familiar with that, with that term, that would essentially be a supercardioid or hypercardioid uh, pickup pattern. Is that right? Yes, that's how I understand it, yeah. Bingo. Okay, uh, another one, I guess the figure eight might be obvious when you're looking at the pattern here, also called bi-directional. Um, yeah, I guess these are fewer and further between than the other models we're talking about. Um, but yeah, tell us a bit about the figure of eight style microphone and uh, any examples that, well, I guess we say here it's great for stereo recording situations. Um, but maybe any applications that you've had a lot of success with this type of mic. Yeah, so this isn't necessarily a stereo microphone, although like maybe you look at this pattern and you assume like one side's going to be pan left and one side's going to be pan right. That's not what uh, I'm, what we're getting at here with this diagram. What this is is just saying that um, from the front of the microphone, you're going to get a sound response, and from the back of the microphone, you're going to get response. But on the sides, you've got rejection. So this is a common figure, uh, sorry, a common uh, pickup pattern for ribbon microphones, which you mentioned there, uh, which is a microphone that I use uh, quite often on a large variety of instruments. Um, so the, the figure eight pattern for me is useful because uh, it does pick up a bit of room and it gives you that sense of space. Um, and it also uh, gives you the option of, of good rejection on the side. So people will often use them in tandem with a second microphone. And what they do is they have uh, this figure eight pattern kind of on the left and, si and right side. So on this graphic, you'll see there's like the 90 degree point or the 70 degree point. Let's say the, the acoustic guitar is at that 270 degree or that 90 degree position. And then you have another microphone that is pointed directly at the acoustic, either at that 90 or 270 degree position. That's a cardioid pattern. And then you can process those two signals for a stereo result that gives you kind of this left-right image on the, the uh, figure eight, as well as this kind of pointed center channel with the cardioid that's at the 270 or the 90. That's a little convoluted way of describing it, um, but it's basically a microphone uh, pickup pattern for giving a sense of space and also providing the option of rejection on the two sides. Right. Okay. And another way that people use this uh, microphone is that they'll do they'll put two vocalists, one on either side. That's a if if you're doing back around vocals or something like that, this is a great solution for doing two vocalists at once. Bingo. I jumped the gun a bit there, um, but yeah, our last example here, omnidirectional. The name says a lot, uh, but essentially we, the point is in the center, and it will pick up sound equally from anywhere within its uh, sonic sphere. Um, yeah, I mean, we talk about it here, great for ambient or room mics, being able to pick up both the source and any reflections very naturally, gang vocals or group or choral vocals. Um, yeah, what are some examples of this? And uh, again, maybe some uh, examples of applications where this particular microphone has come in very handy in your work. Yeah, so for me personally, I generally, when I'm doing a drum session, I have an omnidirectional microphone. Uh, that we call the trash mic and we put it kind of either really far away from the drum kit or it just maybe three feet in front of a drum kit um, and then we compress it on, on the way into our computer and that gives this kind of raunchy really aggressive really forward sound and we just kind of creep that in under the drums and it adds this really exciting kind of rock feeling uh, that's kind of ubiquitous when it comes to drum sounds is this kind of crushed distant thing that just kind of settles under so when the cymbals all decay you hear this nice kind of breathing of the room and the space and it really just kind of paints the picture of like a band in a room. Um, yeah, like percussion, like um, often I, I'll put up an Omni mic kind of three feet away from myself and if I'm doing the percussion and I'm also running the session, um, I just kind of sit at my workstation and do the percussion. I don't have to get up and turn towards the mic because the mic's kind of just picking up everything and if you've got a nice sounding room, um, there's not a lot that you have to do in terms of treatment or you might not need to process as much reverb or put that kind of short room that you might put on your shakers or your tambourines if you've just got this omnidirectional mic kind of a few feet away from you and your room sounds nice. 
um, or like claps. If I'm doing a group claps where maybe the, the, there's a group of people standing around one microphone, I definitely use the omnidirection and get people to stand closer or far depending on you know how many people there are or who's the best clapper who's best in time that kind of stuff um, and another benefit to this pickup pattern is that uh, it's it's kind of emulates what your ears are like so it is known to have like a flat or true sound so it's a it's always kind of like a true kind of picture of what your ears see or hear rather um, just getting back to that uh, idea of the the microphone as a lens like this would be the closest thing to, to what you're ears kind of pick up it just in a room. Mm -hmm. uh, so then fair to say, like you mentioned that an omnidirectional, especially if your room is treated and, and good sounding, that it's a very useful tool. Since we're talking home recording uh, and typically, you know, if there's one instrument that you're not going to do in your bedroom or basement, it's very often the drums. Uh, so does that mean like the omnidirectional may not be your best choice if uh, you're in a, say, less than ideal acoustic environment? I would say that's an adequate assessment, yeah. Often uh, you can get microphones that have swappable capsules. So I've got a couple of Avant Tone microphones and they have just these little twist off tops and you can put on all of the things that we went through here, all the little capsule types or pickup pattern types, you can just screw on a different top and uh, voila you've got that so there's good budget options uh, low budget options where you can swap the, the capsules and then as your room gets treated over time you can maybe experiment a bit more with these more open sounding microphones right uh, I should toss in now like a, another great example of that where it's actually not a switchable capsule but where you can just turn your dial uh, blues Yeti Pro microphone it's very very inexpensive it connects directly to your computer via USB so very much designed for like a home recordist for podcasters uh, we use one for the Canadian musician radio program and yeah you have the choice to switch from Figure eight, cardioid, omnidirectional. There's uh, four options on it, and uh, it's a very useful tool, especially for some of the applications we'll be describing here. Um, so yeah, we we're talking about the different pickup patterns. Uh, next, we're going to talk about the different types of microphones, which typically fall into these three categories: dynamic, condenser, and ribbon. Um, and we'll have Adam kind of walk us through each. But this is where the slides get a bit dense, just to give you as much info as possible for. Uh, when you're digest, digesting this after the fact. And I'll say now too, we're going to walk through the different types of microphones. We'll open it up to questions after that. So uh, whether you've got a question about anything we've spoken about thus far, or I mean, really, uh, Adam is here for you. So if you've got any questions even beyond uh, the scope of what we're talking about here, feel, through, uh, feel free to throw those at us now. We'll get to as many as we can at the halfway point. And then, like I say, more coming at the very end. Um, this is a great opportunity, so fire away. Uh, but yeah, we'll begin with the dynamic microphone, uh, the Shure SM57 and SM58 that we mentioned earlier are um, you know, very common examples of this. But here, let's walk through it a bit. Um, so yeah, a fixed magnet with the moving capsule is a very kind of basic way to explain that. Um, Adam, if you wouldn't mind playing resident scientist, uh, yeah, walk us through some of these different characteristics and uh, different uses for dynamic microphones specifically. Great. Yeah, maybe I'll just start by saying that like a microphone is a transducer, so it takes changes in air pressure and it translates that into voltage. So often you have a magnet involved because uh, you can create voltage by moving um, a piece of metal across a magnet and then amping that up. So a dynamic microphone. Uh, it, it, it's that exact thing. There's a fixed magnet, and then as you talk into it, there's a plate that moves at different speeds depending on the frequency, uh, and then that gets translated into voltage. That's a very way to put it. Um, these microphones, dynamic microphones, are super great uh, starter microphones. Like every studio in the world would have an SM57, as I've said, and those are great microphones for untreated rooms, great microphones for beginners on instruments. If you've got a pop filter, it's great to put on voltage. Vo vo the void the human voice. Um, you'll see videos of like Tom Petty. He used to sing into a SM57 as his lead vocal microphone through like the 70s and 80s, which is I find is kind of interesting because um, you don't hear a lot of these this popping and stuff. But he's just got a unique microphone technique. I think one of the things to note about dynamic microphones is that um, the closer you get to them, uh, they'll create more low end. So sometimes that's a good thing, or sometimes it's a bad thing. Um, it's just something you have to manage either 
with performance if the artist is really good at uh, leaning into the microphone during those intimate moments where you want that low end and then backing off when they're being loud and you just don't need that that sub content um, or if you want to get more boom out of your acoustic guitar you're just going to pull that thing a little closer or if it needs to be a little thinner you're going to pull it back and turn up the gain on your preamp to uh, to adjust that one of the microphones we see pictured here, it's uh, the SM7. So there's three very popular microphones from Shure that uh, everybody kind of in the industry generally uh, uses or knows about. The SM7 is that top one. It requires a lot of gain uh, in order to, 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 to work effectively. So you need a nice preamp for that microphone or even one of those R2 pre's. That's something you can basically turn up. It might get a little noisy, but it's often worth it. That's a common microphone for radio uh, voiceovers or sorry, just radio voice, uh, and it's the microphone I'm speaking into right now, although mine is uh, heavily treated, so it might not be true to the sound of that microphone flat or just without any EQ on it. Um, yeah, like I say in the notes here, it's focused with good re-rejection, which again is good for a, tr a room that doesn't have a lot of acoustic treatment. One of these is just a great thing to have at home. I would say an SM57 should be everybody's first microphone. Um, that's not always the case, but uh, and it wasn't the case with me but I would uh, say that it would have been nice if I had done that. These are the mics you see at uh, lots of bars. When you go to play a bar, the sound guy might have a handful of F SM57s and SM58s for all the voices. Sennheiser has a great uh, line of dynamic microphones, the E-series, that are pretty ubiquitous as well. Um, there's like the 900s, other kind of premium dynamic ones, and then you've got 800s and 600s, all of which are totally great and total, totally reliable um, and can be used for recording just as well as in, in live environments. Um, yeah, what can I say? They'll take a lot of volume, so that's why you see these types of microphones used on snare drums and kick drums. There's like a, a specific kind of kick drum, a couple of kick drums that we'll mention later. Um, that they're dynamic mics, you know, that's got that rigid magnet and a little plate and just moves across that, uh, that magnet and creates voltage that gets translated to uh, sound. Beauty. Um, yeah, condenser mics. Everything is pretty much here. So I guess we can start like whereas um, the dynamic has the fixed magnet uh, and the one that moves and conducts or sorry, turns into voltage. Uh, what's the difference between that and the condenser? And then uh, I guess I'll just leave it to you to uh, walk us through some of these various characteristics. Great. Yeah, so condenser mics, instead of having a magnet on one side, it's just two plates and then between the plates is voltage and as the uh, voltage as the plates move, there's one fixed plate and one that's floating. Uh, as that second plate moves into the fixed plate, it creates a different uh, voltage in between the plates that gets calculated and the amp, the preamp will juice it up. Um, they're a little more sensitive, like if you drop a condenser mic, it, the, the capsule might fall out or might break off and become disconnected. So they're a little more delicate than a condenser mic. So you'll often see them on, sh on shock mounts to reduce, that's actually for reducing low end transmission to the microphone because this technology is a little more sensitive. One of the things about condenser mics is that you'll notice right away if you put up like a dynamic mic and a condenser mic and compare them, the condenser mic will sound, I'd describe it as being more detailed. Um, it'll also pick up more of the room. They're often wider in their pickup patterns meaning uh, uh, they're more sensitive to like noise. So if you live in a noisy apartment building uh, or if you're next to a window where there's a lot of traffic and you're trying to record vocals, a condenser mic may not be your best option if you've got a noisy environment. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why we say here that it's well suited for a treated, a treated environment. It's because you're gonna get more of that room sound in the microphone. Um, they'll have a typically a louder output than a dynamic microphone, so you might be able to get away with a preamp that is a little less costly or a little more noisy and you won't have to push it as hard. These microphones require 48 volts of electricity, so you want to make sure you have a preamp or a mixer that can spit out that 48 volts um, because they basically will not sound without that. And some of the microphones will have like a little battery slot and you can put a battery in it. Um, like boom mics we mentioned earlier, those are all generally uh, condenser microphones um, and either run from a battery or like a portable system that can pump out that 48 volts and that 48 volts is what goes between those plates and then they create the, the difference in voltage. Um, yeah, it says here that they're available in tube and solid I don't know if solid state's really the right, right word. It is, well, yeah, it's a transistor that's in the microphone and then often you'll get uh, these tube condenser microphones that can get 
really pricey um, and uh, really nice and high end. You can kind of pay whatever you want for a condenser mic, and all the way from down to, down to from like eighty dollars to eighty thousand dollars, whatever you want. Um, they're kind of the most ubiquitous for the studio environment for vocals. You'll see people singing into like Neumann U87s would be kind of maybe the most ubiquitous classiest condenser microphone that's out there. Um, they get used as drum overheads a lot of time. Room mics on drums, acoustic guitars, very, very common for people to use condenser mics on acoustic guitars in like an XY pattern or in a stereo pattern. I use them in the studio all the time for acoustic guitars generally. Uh, sometimes I'm using a 57, I mentioned that a little later, um, on acoustic guitars. Uh, oh, drum overheads, 99% of the time I'm using that AKG you see in the top there, that uh, 452 I think it is, I don't know right off the top of my head. Um, basically, uh, yeah, every studio's got a pile of these and if it were me at home and I was just starting out, I'd, I'd definitely want one of those SN57s and I'd also want one of uh, a condenser of some kind, either, either a large one like we see here, this Sennheiser in the bottom right, or a small one that's uh, that, that AKG we see up there. So you have your large diaphragm condenser and the small diaphragm condenser and generally the large diaphragm condenser has a better low end response, but that's not always the case. It just depends on the uh, microphone style. We've got some great questions here uh, that I appreciate um, and I could jump into right now, but we've only got the one more uh, kind of microphone to discuss. So we'll get this into the mix and then uh, throw to some of these cues. Uh, ribbon mics. The Royer 121, which uh, I guess I can plug Adam was kind enough to review for us in Canadian Musician and Professional Sound a while ago and has since become a staple at the Hill Sound Studio. Um, so yeah, Riven microphone, a very uh, unique and uh, cool model here. Um, Rode just came out with a new one a couple of years ago. Uh, yeah, walk us through the characteristics of this one, if you please, and then uh, yeah, we'll jump to some questions and move on to our next half. Totally, yeah, thanks. Um, so actually what we have pictured here is the Royer 122, which is a Riven microphone. Uh, that's kind of a beefed up version of the classic Royer 121. These are, uh, yeah, like a kind of a dark sounding microphone um, and they're, they have a really fast attack, which means uh, they're really great for drum rooms, meaning that that first punch of those drums uh, hits this microphone really well and, and kind of fast. And then when you comes out the speakers, when that gets translated into a playback environment, it, it's, it's just the snares and all those kinds of transients poke out and really sound uh, live and present and can give your music a lot of great depth. This isn't a microphone uh, that people generally use on vocals, it's more of an instrument mi uh, an in instrument microphone and 99% in of the time these ribbon microphones are figure eight patterns just because of the nature of the technology. It's probably 100% of the time, I, I, I don't really know off the top of my head, but um, basically you have a little thin corrugated piece of aluminum sitting between two magnets which you can actually see the magnets on the microphone, they're those kind of wings on the outside of that top part. Um, and uh, basically these microphones, I just love the way these sound. They're dark, so if you've got an instrument that sounds like brittle or bright, you put this thing on it, it just sounds rich. And yeah, vibey is a great word that you have in there. That's just a perfect uh, description of what this mic is. Um, yeah, and it says uses there, mono drum room, strings, it sounds so great on violin, I love it, and guitar amps. A lot of people use these for guitar amps in the studio alongside a 57 or they use these for guitar amps live settings which to me is kind of surprising but uh, it's, it's a really common live mic as well. It's just got a great low end response, really fast attack and uh, it does require a lot of gain. Um, the the 121 and most Ruben microphones do not require phantom power. It can be broken if you give them phantom power because that aluminum filament is so delicate. Um, yeah, it's just it's a really fun microphone for me to use and to have discovered through through getting that review. Awesome. Um, so I said we'd jump to questions, but I guess we can round it out here with some accessories, one of which you see in the image here. Uh, uh, but yeah, why don't we walk through these really quickly uh, and then we'll jump to some of these questions. Yeah, great. These are pretty simple. You got a pop filter there. I'm sure everyone has seen what that is and understands that's just used to prevent big popping sounds which come out for consonants that have a lot of air that push across them like P's or B's or sometimes T's. Maybe it's happening to my microphone right now. I have removed the pop filter. Um, the shock mount is used to reduce low end transmission 
it to the microphones, so condenser microphones, often the capsule is really sensitive to uh, handling noise, they call it, where if you touch the mic and shake it, it's going to get all this low-end rumble. That's why you have these mounts with rubber bands that kind of suspend it, is to prevent other instruments that might be transmitting through the floor, up the mic stand, and into the mic, creating that low-end kind of rumble. So if you're like playing the acoustic guitar and you're stomping the, your foot on the floor, a shock mount will help prevent low-end kind of blurriness that could uh, result from that. A reflection filter, uh, if you've seen those, they're really cool. It's just like this rounded a foam thing on a stand, for lack of a better description, uh, that helps reduce the room sound reaching into the mic. SE makes a, a great line of reflection filters worth looking into. If you don't want to treat your whole room, you can just create this little kind of, uh, I don't tent's not the right word, but uh, just a kind of a foam uh, baffle on a stand that you sing into that your mic sits into. An XY mount is just a mount in which you can place two small diaphragm condensers or two microphones of any kind in an XY configuration, which we'll talk about in a sec, uh, and it just makes that setup a little easier where you don't need two stands, you just need one stand and this little mount. And a dual mic mount is, a, is the same thing, it's just basically a mount that holds two microphones on a stand uh, as opposed to two stands holding two microphones. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just to be totally clear, and it may very well be obvious, but the shock mount, as you can see in the photo, is how the stand is sort of isolated from the mic with that series of um, elastic cordage there. Uh, it reminds you very much of like in high school science class when you had to come up with a device to drop an egg off the roof and anyone who didn't break uh, would get the grade. Very much related to this concept here. <laughs> yeah, great for vocals. So, okay, some great questions here. Feel free to continue to throw them at us as we're talking. And as I mentioned, if we don't get to yours now, uh, we will by the end of the session here. Um, but let's get rolling. The very first one that came in, actually it's a bit tough. Maybe we'll start here. Uh, a really good question here, an interesting one. Adam, uh, what's more important if you're trying to get started with home recording, maybe have an untreated space like a room in your house, is it a better idea to invest a lot of money in a great microphone uh, and use it in the untreated environment or would you recommend a much cheaper alternative for the microphone but putting some money into treating the room? Yeah, this is a totally a great question. And I personally would say that you should meet in the middle on both of those uh, both of those uh, investments, let's say. Yeah, I would definitely buy like that SM57 and put paneling up in my room or build a simple baffle that I could maybe move around versus uh, just putting all my eggs in one basket and getting a really nice microphone. Often a really expensive microphone is a condensed it's really open sounding and it's getting a lot of that room sound so you're not doing yourselves any favors by putting that classic microphone which is generally designed for a studio environment in a really like gnarly sounding room that might be like boingy or, or, or reflective sounding and it really that can take away from some of the intimacy so my suggestion would be yeah like go mid-grade for both of those things and you'll be you'll have a way better footing Awesome. Um, yeah, we, when we were talking about the SM58 and some uh, mics for vocal use, and we will, I guess we are kind of jumping the gun with this, but uh, again, a good question. We appreciate the engagement. Um, someone had asked about like an ideal microphone for capturing the female voice. I know in a lot of cases, you know, a good model will do just as well for each, but uh, yeah, have you ever mixed up your choice based on uh, having a higher vocal range? Ooh, yeah, great question. Um, every microphone's different. Every vocalist is different. I wouldn't say that uh, it, it's based on, on gender ever or, or pitch ever. It's more tone and timbre um, that makes my, my decision in terms of selecting microphones. So if the person has a like a nasal tone, um, I might choose a darker mic. Um, like I maybe if they were very nasal, maybe I'd try that Royal Ribbon to see if it really tamed down that that one to three k area that some people have an issue with. Um, or maybe I'm going to use that SM7 if people have a really bright voice and I want to I want that warmth and I want that intimacy. I'm going to use a dynamic mic. Um, whereas if someone has a really b bassy voice and I want to get some top end clarity, I might try a condenser. I might try a, a small diaphragm condenser. Um, but it's like I said, it's not based on pitch generally. It's based on tone and timbre. Um, 
Yeah. Okay. So the question uh, that started off, and it is a great one. I just thought we'd uh, lob some easier ones at you. Uh, yeah, someone's asking about phasing when it comes to different mic techniques, and uh, I guess we are going to get to this. So Adam, if you want to defer until after we've spoken about, you know, some of the ways for miking up a guitar cab, or maybe better yet, a snare drum, for example, that are you know very dependent on phase. Um, or actually, maybe we can just introduce exactly what phasing means and uh, some just general rules to make sure that you're in an optimal position to avoid that. Absolutely. So you've got uh, absolute phase, which is it basically means what uh, direction is your polarity. So we talked about voltage. Um, you have positive or negative voltage. Um, so you've got a frequency. It's it's oscillating from positive to negative, and um, if the the absolute phase meaning uh, it's starting positive is what you want when you zoom in on your on your waveform in your DAW you see that kick drum transient or you see that guitar hit or you see that P from your pop uh, of a word um, you want to see that all of those uh, transients are starting in a positive manner meaning that waveform starts by going up and then comes down and the way that translates to a speaker is that the speaker is going to be pushing out when that uh, digital information gets translated back into uh, sound pressure waves through the speaker so that the speakers are doing the right thing when that kick drum hits and that transient pushes the speakers pushing out so that's your absolute phase meaning the polarity of the microphone and then when you talk about phasing it's generally people are talking about either two instruments or two microphone sources being in phase with one another um, meaning what can happen is uh, two, two, two sources can get picked up and if the phase isn't aligned beautifully or in a nice way, you'll start to find that some frequencies get subtracted and other frequencies get boosted. And you end up with an unbalanced sound or another issue would be if you had things that were mic'd up in phase um, and you just swapped the phase on one of them, one speaker would be pushing the sound and the other speaker would be pulling the sound. And that creates a strange auditory kind of psychoacoustic illusion where uh, your brain is just like, what's going on here? <laughs> it's a, a little hard to describe, and it's not something I describe very often or very well. But um, yeah, we'll talk a bit more. Like, say, the snare drum is a great example for uh, multiple microphones uh, phasing with one another. Basically, if I, you're only going to run into it as an issue if you're multiple, if you're using two microphones at one sound source. And there's a, something called the three to one rule where the distance between the two microphones and the distance between the sound source should always be uh, either the same or, or three times greater, meaning the distance between the sound source and the two microphones is three times greater. So the three to um, one rule would be something to look up there if I've just confused everybody. <laughs> Well, I was just going to step in and the like explain this to me like I'm five because I'm the person that needed this explained to them like they're five. Um, but yeah, when you consider every sound is basically just a wave that goes up and down and uh, you know equally dynamic, something being totally out of phase would be when it's the exact same sound source and when one uh, pickup device is getting that wave at its very top, the other is getting it at its very bottom. It's basically how uh, noise cancelling headphones work, like if you're on an airplane and want your noise cancelling headphones, there's an active microphone that's picking up everything outside of your microphone uh, or outside of your headphone story and then basically reproducing those exact sounds 180 degrees out of phase into your headphones which is what lets you listen to your uh, Joni Mitchell record and completely avoid the screaming kid next to you. Um, it is a tough thing to talk about, so if you throw in and out of phase into Google, uh, you'll probably get a very good like graphic visual example of that, but thank you, Adam, for what was a very good try there. We've, I'm sorry, not a try, because you were successful, just if anyone wants more information. Oh, no, it was a try. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's move on here. Yeah, a couple more questions. It, these ones should have pretty quick answers, and we'll jump back into this. Um, someone's just asking for a clarification when we talk about tube versus solid state microphones or tube versus non tube microphones. Uh, what's the difference? Uh, one of them has a, so the tube microphone has a little vacuum tube built into it. Um, I'm not sure uh, exactly the, the science behind what that job, that tube is. I believe it's involved with the amplification of the, the, the voltage. Um, I think that's what it is. Um, 
so one has a little vacuum tube. You may have seen them in tube amps or like like at home theater systems or uh, home uh, stereo systems, rather, or in guitar amps, those little glowing tubes in the back. So you can have microphones that have those tubes built right into them, or there's a power supply that's a separate block that the tube is sitting in. Whereas most microphones, like all the dynamic ones that we mentioned, or the some of the ribbon ones, there's a trans, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, trans, not a transducer, a basically a coil of uh, metal instead of this, t this tube. <laughs> and the characteristics being, being different would be like a tube microphone would be uh, just a little warmer sounding, a little richer sounding, a little more vintage sounding, a little darker, and they're a little less easy to reproduce because every Every tube is a little different and tubes will wear out differently over time. So if you're looking for something that's kind of more reliably clean, you're going to go with a non-tube mic or a solid state mic. Right on. Um, shout out to Jackie here because I really want to hear her sing now. Um, it sounds like she was asking more in a live environment, although maybe there's a solution that would fit both live and studio. Uh, but she is a rich voiced, so let me, let me get the wording here. Uh oh, I just removed it. Uh, a rich voiced singer with a large range that sings in both rock and jazz. Um, so yeah, I'm just thinking a very big dynamic voice, a lot of octaves. Um, can you recommend something she should even just give a try as far as singing and uh, yeah, favorably picking up her voice? Ooh, that's a great question. I, I always would suggest every vocalist become extremely familiar with the SM58 um, because it's kind of the, the king of vocal mi microphones, especially in a live setting. Um, and if you want something with a bit more dynamic range and a bit lower noise floor uh, and something that's maybe a little more fun to sing into, you're going to look at maybe the Beta 58 line. It sure has kind of more of a, a higher end version of that that microphone that a lot of vocalists seems to really love. And there's also uh, Neumann Microphones has uh, a great uh, dynamic microphone. Um, I don't know the, uh, the model number right off the bat, but um, they make like a, a kind of a SM58 equivalent that's uh, again got a really large dynamic range, can handle a lot of sound pressure, um, and has extended low frequency. Uh. Um, great question just came in from Madeline. We will save that because we're actually going to talk about miking up horns in a minute. Uh, but if we don't touch on this, I'll put that in front of Adam. Uh, Laura, your question coming up as well. But let's roll on here. And I see we're creeping up on the hour here. Uh, so not that we want to rush through it. But as I mentioned, there's a lot of info in the slideshow itself. So um, you can just have Adam kind of scan through it and add any tidbits that are uh, unique to the or his experience, I should say, but I guess we talked about this uh, earlier, like when you're building your collection, and uh, Adam, I hope you don't mind, after I walk through this, feel free to add anything. Um, he stated several times, the Shure SM, oh, there's a typo, SM57, uh, which you see in the bottom right corner there, is a great all-purpose instrument microphone. It has been used on voice on some very famous recordings in the past, so a very versatile uh, I was going to say dynamic, but maybe that's not the best term to use uh, just because it could be confusing. Um, but a very versatile, all purpose microphone. Uh, some other staples here, and we've got them like for vocals. We've mentioned the SM58, arguably the universal standard when you think of a live or a microphone in general. That very well might be what pops in mind. Um, SM7, we'll have a photo of that shortly. Uh, NT1A, a great example of a relatively inexpensive large diaphragm uh, microphone, same with the 4040 from Audio-Technica uh, instruments. I mean, it's all here for you, and we'll talk about some of uh, these specific examples uh, coming up in a second. And as Adam alluded to earlier, the designated kick drum, kick drum microphone, uh, you see we've got a picture of Adam Sure Beta 52 in the top right there. Uh, the AKG D112 looks very similar to that. Again, like a very big kind of stubby microphone that I guess sort of physically suits what you think of it being used for with a kick drum or uh, a really punchy low end source. You want to add anything in there before we jump to some of these common mic configurations? No, you've covered it all. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, well, it's all your information. I just thought I'd mouth through it to speak quickly, and because I 
yeah, uh, common configurations though. So we've alluded to X, Y, and stereo pair already, but uh, let's just quickly walk through these, Adam, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, so we've got a mono a microphone technique. That just means basically one mic pointed anywhere at what you're looking to pick up. X, Y, stereo means you've got two microphones really close together with their, they're almost sitting on top of one another, crossed at nine degrees or 120 degrees depending on how wide you want them to sound. If you got a stereo pair, it just means two uh, microphones pointed at one source. This is one that you definitely want to do that three to one rule that we mentioned earlier. It's worth looking up. A Bloomian, Bloomian pair is typically two figure eight mics in XY pattern. And that's a really unique thing that I personally have never done before, but I'll see that done for huge orchestral pro uh, projects. They'll have these Bloomian pairs sitting around the room and mid side was the one I described earlier where you have one figure eight and one cardioid uh, working in stereo and it creates this kind of three point image where you've got one of the figure eight sides on your left speaker, one of the figure eight sides on your right speaker, and then this condenser, uh, sorry, cardioid imager on the center channel. And it, it's a pretty unique thing that we've done a couple times for like a drum room mic or if you were doing like a, a group of stringed instruments, it would, it would give a good re real life representation. Mm. I'm interested in that uh, Bloomian pair because when I picture the two figure eights in XY pattern, it almost seems like an omnidirectional except you've got the ability to manipulate or more closely manipulate those two uh, different pickups. Is that accurate? Like is that a common use for this? I feel like it's used kind of to simulate an omnidirectional microphone, um, but when you only have two uh, to figure eight patterns at hand, uh, it's it's kind of something that people kind of they don't they don't really tweak it too much. You kind of set it up and let every let all of the microphones do their job. It's not something you're often tweaking. Hmm. I don't know if that answers your question. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it just seems like an interesting concept I and mean, picture what those patterns would look like. Um, but alas, uh, so yeah, talking now about uh, some very basic kind of general tips of if you're looking to mic some common sound sources, we're going to talk about vocals, acoustic and electric guitar, uh, we'll talk about drums, and then we'll get to horns and strings as well. Uh, so yeah, we're coming at you, Laura, um, or sorry, Madison was the one that asked about uh, the horns, which is a great question. We're going to get to it in a sec, but uh, yeah, lead vocals. I mean, we talked about the pop filter in front of the microphone, shock mount underneath it, which uh, both great ideas for this application. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, if you're going for that very basic no frills vocal track, Adam, uh, walk us through some of these other general pointers, if you please. Yeah, so traditionally in pop music, your voice is front center stage and in order to get that kind of detail and intimacy um, regardless of how big and loud the vocalist is you just get the microphone me personally right up there uh, if I'm using the dynamic mic the person's lips are almost touching that microphone or they're touching the pop filter that's right in front of it um, I use a little vocal kind of booth these two walls of uh, kind of sound treated baffles so that there's no distraction in, from the room and there's no distraction from like my mouse clicking or traffic outside it's a very quiet environment um, basically, you just want to get right in there, uh, make sure you're not clipping, obviously, on your preamp. You want to make sure your settings are, are nice there and that you're leaving headroom for those louder sections. Don't be afraid to record quiet uh, if you're expecting a loud section to come in, um, if, they're a, if the singer is quite dynamic. Um, basically, try set up two or three mics or however many mics you have. Do a test and then decide which is best for that vocalist. I would say that, that that's one of the best things to do is just do a shout out, they call it or shoot out, something you'll call it. <laughs> shout out, that actually makes a lot of sense in this application. Um, yeah, uh, so we've got lead vocals. Now, as far as like chorus or background vocals, shouts out to my hardcore fans out there. It's a staple of it. Um, but yeah, you're after something a little different here, kind of not wanting to compete in that same space. Uh, so what are some examples you could use for that? Or I guess, would this also apply to things like hand claps and um, you know, kind of those group whole room type tracks. 
Yeah, definitely. For for me, um, when I'm when I'm making up background vocals, I'm thinking about yeah, clearing space for the lead vocalist. So I'm often asking vocalists to take a step back from the microphone if they're doing backgrounds, or I'm swapping out to a different microphone, either an omnidirectional, uh, if there's two or three people, or even if I feel like an omnidirectional is going to represent the person well or the room sounding good to me that day, or it's quiet outside, I'll do that. Um, but I generally try not to stack too much of the same microphone or the same distance to the microphone on top of itself uh, because then you kind of start getting this clouded effect where the lead vocal gets a little eaten up even if you just take three steps back for your background vocals if uh, you know if they're not too quiet or whispery if there is a bit of power behind them um, you're going to notice that they sit in the mix a lot better and that the lead vocal retains its position and those background vocals have a bit of space to play around with. Bingo. Um... Electric guitar, amp, or cab. Again, there's a lot of different ways to do this. Some very creative and crafty and elaborate things people have come up with. But we're talking about, you know, some staples, some industry standards here. Um, so yeah, the electric guitar, amp, uh, or cab. If you're not using the combo, uh, but the image pretty much says it all here. Uh, walk us through this. I mean, we mentioned the SM57 ribbon mic specifically, which is what in the image, uh, what's in the image, but uh, what's the advantage of those two different types of mics? Tell us a bit about placements and maybe any variations of this that might produce some interesting results. Great, yeah. So this is a real classic one. You've got the Royer ribbon and the SM57 in the image. Um, the Royer offers this extended low end and a really fast attack, while the 57 has this punch mid sound that is very like detailed and, and it's just a really ubiquitous kind of guitar sound. Um, often you'll see instead of the Royer ribbon you'll see a, a Sennheiser MD421 and sometimes people just tape that right onto the 57 or the 57 gets taped to the Sennheiser MD421. Um, this is an example of a situation where you want to make sure the capsules are lined up in distance to the speaker because you will get that phase cancellation that we mentioned earlier where those the sound's going to hit one microphone a little later than the other and then you're going to get a little muddy where, where frequencies get cancelled out. So this is one where you want to pay close attention. You record both of these microphones and then what I do is swap the phase on one of them and if the sound almost disappears, I know that my phase is good and that the, the sound is hitting both of those capsules at the exact millisecond. If I'm still hearing it when I'm swapping the phase on one of them, I just move one of the microphones back or forward until it basically cancels out. And then I lift my phase reverse switch and record it and then go to town and blend the microphones as they sound good. Bingo. Uh, acoustic guitar. We're void of an image here, but um, I think the description says a lot of it. Uh, Adam had me record a song that was very simple, acoustic vocals, and this was my first experience with this. Uh, yeah, again, if you don't mind, walk us through your basic configuration as laid out here and uh, again, maybe any uh, variations on that. And my last point here, I've got SM57 with aggressive EQ, question mark, uh, because that <laughs> is uh, something that Adam had proposed. It's, uh, I guess, a bit unique. Yeah, I think a lot of people just kind of go for a small diaphragm condenser when they're recording acoustic guitar or a large diaphragm condenser because it's detailed um, and it picks up a lot of the intricacies in an acoustic guitar. Um, sometimes what I'll do is just use an SM57 and you get kind of this meatier, darker, grittier acoustic guitar sound. So if somebody's not a really strong acoustic guitar player, uh, th this might be a, a great uh, microphone choice because some of those like squeak and clicks and all those kinds of just general uh, artifacts from the actual instrument itself are a little clouded um, by the lack of, of pure detail in that microphone. Um, I generally point the mic any microphone, if it's an SM57 or a condenser, I put it right at the 12th fret and then I try backing it off and I try pointing it at the hole a bit more, but I generally start at that position where the where the body of the guitar meets the neck, um, like nine times out of 10, that's where I find it sounds the best. And nine times out of 10, I'm actually using a mono microphone. I, d I don't do stereo microphones a lot these days unless it's for uh, a song in which I know I'm not going to layer too much on. So if it was just a voice and an acoustic guitar, yeah, I might throw up two mics in an XY position. Um, but if it's a full production and I know I'm just, that acoustic job has a small job in the production of the orchestration, I'm probably going to go with a single microphone on it. Bingo. And then um, I think your description when we were talking was, call me crazy, but I've been using an SM57. <laughs> 
uh, yeah, what makes that a unique choice? And when you mentioned the aggressive EQ, uh, what's the purpose of that? Uh, yeah, it's like it can be a, like a thuddy sounding microphone with a lot, lot of information around 300 hertz. So I just suck out a lot of 300 hertz and I crank a lot of 5K or 8K depending on the guitar and the performer. I just want that high end that a uh, mic gen will generally bring to the table that the 57 might not have. And again, that's probably due a bit to, in part, to the proximity effect in that the mic is close to the guitar and things are a little boomy at times. So I just scoop that stuff right out with an EQ. Bingo. Um, this is a big one to pack into one slide. Uh, and the images here, I guess your two may be most uh, in typical rock music at least, uh, key parts of the drum kit, your kick drum, your snare. We've got those uh, images here in Animal Walk us through those but yeah, when it comes to drums this is really a, a unique animal uh, something that you know a lot of people will do home recording themselves and guitar voice those are easy to track and say a less than idea of acoustic environment drums being a different animal um, let's talk about it great yeah uh, so we hear we see a picture of a kick drum and a snare drum the kick drum in our case in this uh, image has no hole cut into it which might be unique for some people. I think a lot of people kind of just have that hole. I would put the microphone, if it had a hole, put that microphone right where that hole is, where there's a lot of air moving, because you know you're going to get a good re representation of all the low end. You're also going to get a great attack from a skin that has a hole into it. I generally like to record without that hole, because there's a lot of low end that comes off the drum, but I also always use that kick drum microphone channel to trigger um, another kick drum sample when I'm mixing. That gives me that point and that attack. Um, so when I'm micing drums, I spot mic everything, close mics on kick, close mics on snare. We'll put a snare bottom on there. So we see in this picture, we just see the top, or you can kind of see it there. There's a bottom mic, um, and the bottom mic gets the phase reversed on it because they're pointing at each other pretty much, those microphones. So you want to make sure that uh, it's hitting both of those microphones at the same time. Um, microphones, yeah, close mic on the hi-hat, close mic. Like on the toms, I've used two overheads. I used two room mics. That that trash mic we talked about, that mono room mic uh, on the drums. That's a real big important one for me. So that the center channel of the drums has this reality. It's kind of crushed up, chunky uh, feeling. It's kind of a classic drum sound, I'd say. Um, we, sometimes we set up two sets of room mics. Really, people kind of go over the top with drum micing traditionally in the studio environment, and then they pare it down in the mix or you use a little bit of everything. Uh, um, one of the things I mentioned here, which is great for home recorders or people who don't have a big lar uh, microphone connect collection, rather, is uh, the Glyn Johns microphone setup. That's something that if, if you want to record drums at home, you should totally look into. And I've had really great success, and I've worked with producers who insist on using this. And it's basically just three microphones. You've got a kick drum microphone and two overheads that have this kind of strange setup where one's over the floor tom almost, and one's over the top of the drum kit pointed right at the snare. Um, so you don't have these tight spot mics on the toms, but uh, this would be one that you'd hear on like Led Zeppelin recordings where they were limited to track counts back in the day. And it's, super, it's really worth looking into. A lot of people use uh, condenser mics when they're micing up the overheads and the hi-hat mics, but a lot of dynamic mics get used on those close spot mics for the snares and toms and kicks. If it's good enough for Bonzo, it's good enough for you. Um, strings and horn to walk through. <laughs> Um, and yeah, these are both ones I guess that maybe are less common, which also I think means there's a lot more variation on how different engineers will uh, capture these instruments, but um, Adam's got some experience with both, so uh, strings first, horns coming right on the back of it, uh, give us a quick tip. Great. Yeah, so strings are tricky to record because they can be harsh and brittle sounding. That's why I choose ribbons. Uh, a lot of times I used to use cond condensers and I was struggling to get a good sound that would sit in the mix and represent the, all the rich harmonic content that the strings had in the room. And as soon as I started using a ribbon mic, I was like, oh, that's how you record strings. So there are budget ribbons out there if you can't afford the Royer. There's a uh, Rode, like you mentioned earlier, they just came out with one that's probably reasonably priced. And there's um, Art, uh, I think they have a series of ribbon mics. If you can try out a ribbon, uh, go and rent one and see how it works if you're a person who has strings at home and compare it to your other microphones. I think you'll be surprised. Easy. And then uh, horns, Madison, this one's for you. Uh, she mentioned uh, having heard that ribbon mics work really well on horns, but also that uh, there's a risk for that, which, uh, well, we've got all capped here, though it was 
admonition, but uh, tell us about your <laughs> approach for capturing horns. Very much the same as strings, where it's like I was having trouble capturing horns. Um, they're super loud, so you need a, 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 a mic that can handle that. Um, they can feel harsh because, you know, it's because of the nature of microphones are pointed right at the hole, which is kind of what I generally do. I've, these days I've been backing off a bit of foot, and I've been using a ribbon microphone because it's got that extended low end and that fast attack. Um, again, if you can uh, just try renting, if you've struggled recording home, horns at home, just rent a ribbon microphone, test it out, and you're like, oh, there it is. This works really easily. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but uh, you mentioned it earlier too, like with that very, very thin aluminum filament, uh, you can't throw too much volume into a ribbon mic, which I think is why you mentioned it's surprising that some people use them on a cab, um, which, you know, I guess is fine in the studio, but live might be uh, yeah. cringeworthy. But yeah, just be careful with your investment. Awesome. I'm very excited. I'm glad we got through uh, that in great time. Um, few more questions here. So yeah, Madeline, hopefully that answers yours. Uh, or I, I guess, she, yeah, she'd ask about, you know, anything else she needs to know when handling uh, a ribbon mic or maybe just any properties as far as being a responsible mic owner. Any tips? Yeah, uh, treat it uh, like a little baby. <laughs> don't drop it. Um, one, of the, one of the things is you don't like breathe too hard across it. Like don't intentionally let it catch a bunch of wind because it'll it could tear the ribbon the ribbon's only going to last so long um so it will at some point it, it'll start to change in the way it sounds and then um, who knows how many years you might need to get re-ribboned or if it was a low-end kind of mic um maybe you can send it back to the factory and they have some kind of system in place where you can pay for have them ribboned i'm not sure uh, i haven't dealt with that yet myself uh, just because i'm still relatively new ribbon mic owner um, and yeah one of the benefits to the ribbon mic that we have here the 122 is that it has a pad which is a volume reduction so it's designed to 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 uh, to be hit with a lot of volume and you just hit the switch and it's it protects itself basically one way to prevent uh, it from being too hurt is just back it off or point it slightly away one thing about ribbon microphones is that if you just point them slightly away it doesn't change the character of the, ra the sound as much as other types of microphones would so you just don't don't sing right in, into it or don't play the horn right into it just turn the microphone you know 30 degrees off axis and play into that and you'll probably uh, extend its life a bit Bingo. Um, we got through a lot of questions at the first half. If anyone has anything else, even if it's a little off topic, we might as well get it out now because there's only one more here. Um, and yeah, it's, is there a microphone that's ideal for YouTube uploads? What I would say there, and um, you know, obviously a, a very well recorded track, if you upload it to YouTube, it'll carry enough information that you can tell the difference between that and a crappy one. But if you're looking for, like I'm assuming maybe just to upload some demos or some covers, uh, to YouTube sort of on the fly. A couple we mentioned, like Rhodes NT-USB, for example, is like a very inexpensive, large diaphragm uh, mic that has a USB connection, will go direct into your computer. Uh, it's very, very, very low noise. And um, yeah, I think it would do the job for inexpensive for what you want to do it for. I also mentioned Blue's Yeti Pro, which is a great one, just being able to switch from the different pickup patterns. It's also large diaphragm, direct USB, uh, comes with a you know hefty stand, and it also looks very cool. Um, so yeah, not that you can't, uh, you know, there's nothing hurting you from going big if you're uploading to YouTube, but even just having a designated mic, as inexpensive as it might be, you're already leaps and bounds ahead of what uh, gets posted there a lot, so uh, I will leave it to Adam. Maybe he's got some stories of you know something good and inexpensive that's uh, ideal for that. But those two models I mentioned are great examples. And um, if you throw that again into Google and maybe crowdsource some reviews, I, you'll probably come up with some great options there as well. Yeah, totally. Uh, those are two great options. Sennheiser makes a digital microphone, the MK4 digital, I believe. That's another good option. Um, one thing to note about YouTube is that all of the volume of everything on YouTube is normalized to some degree, meaning that YouTube turns up or down the volume on the content that you submit so that when people are listening to YouTube, they don't have to reach 
for their volume knob all the time. So one way to prevent your music from sounding uh, too crappy on YouTube, which can happen quite easily, is don't record it too hot or don't put your output super, super loud because YouTube will take care of uh, making it as loud as it wants to be for their listeners. Uh, and if you hit it too hot, you, it's not going to sound as good as if you hit it just under where they want you to hit it. Uh, bingo. Um, yeah, that brings us to the end here. Uh, thank you very, very much for joining us. More than appreciated. I mentioned uh, at the beginning, if you go to musicbooksplus.com slash webinar, uh, here are some kind of catch-all books that will build on what we're talking about. If you are interested in sinking your teeth into home recording, some great titles here. There's many more at the site as well as some tips for uh, making the most of your webinar experience. Um, since you've registered, you'll get an email, I think 24 hours from now, uh, sharing a link to this recording so you can access our whole session here uh, at your leisure. Um, feel free to replay it and everything. There we go. Stop seeing that screen. And yeah, big thanks, Adam Gallant from the Hill Sound Studio in Charlottetown, PEI. Uh, great little room, very ex experienced engineer, and you can't find a more beautiful part of the country. Uh, again, that's where I am. That's how I know Adam. And uh, so if you're looking for somewhere to cut some tracks, consider that. Uh, there's info at the website as well. You can get in touch with Adam. You can get in touch with us at NWC Webinars. Um, Again, my name is Andrew King, editor of Canadian Musician, Adam Gallant, owner, operator, engineer, mixer, producer, uh, many things at the Hill Sound Studio. Huge thank you for joining us. It was a privilege having you. Thanks so much for having me. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks again to everyone. Uh, please fill out the survey on your way out. It just helps us better uh, cater these towards you. Um, yeah. Thank you very, very much.